Our scripture reading today is Acts chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 26 and read through the end of the chapter, which is verse 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotos and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we are in a Baptist church, and I would think it's pretty safe to say that if I asked you all, when do we baptize someone, you're probably going to tell me, well, you baptize them upon the profession of faith, believer's baptism. And then if I ask you, so how do we baptize someone, what's the way we baptize, I'm pretty sure most of you are going to say, well, we baptize by immersion, we put them in the pool back here, and we dunk them under the water. And that's, that's, that's what I would agree with. But then I would ask you, how committed are you to that belief? Or maybe how adamant are you about that belief? Because you see, over the history of time, baptism has been one of the things that has most divided the church and the denominations. Now we go back to 1517. We talked about Martin Luther last week, how his 95 Thesis sparked the Protestant Reformation. But that spark caused an explosion of thought and ideas and understandings of the Bible. And one of those understandings was baptism. And just eight years after Martin Luther, in 1525, a movement began. It was called the Anabaptist Movement. Anabaptist meaning one who is rebaptized or baptized again. You see, these folks had all been baptized as babies, but by reading Scripture, they came to the belief that a professing believer should be baptized. And not just by pouring or sprinkling the water, but by immersion. And so they began this practice. Well, it didn't take long for that to cause controversy. You know, for over a thousand years, they had been baptizing babies by pouring the water or sprinkling it on their heads. And within a year, a law was passed in the city of Zurich, Switzerland, making rebaptism a capital crime. In less than a year, in January of 1527, Felix Manns was the first Anabaptist to be executed for his belief in rebaptism. And they executed him by drowning him. After that, over the next 10 years, history tells us some 5,000 Anabaptists were put to death for their belief, either by drowning or burning at the stake or other means of execution. And this was being done to them by the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutherans, other Protestants. Other Christians were killing these Christian believers all over the thought and theology of baptism. And it made me think about something one of my seminary professors had said. He said, the ordinances, he said the sacraments, he was a Presbyterian, but the ordinances or sacraments were given by Christ to unite the church. 
Yet tragically and unfortunately, these have been the things that have most commonly divided us. And I'd like to see that unification begin again. I'd like to see us come together. Sure, we have diversity of opinion. But let's not estrange our brothers and sisters in Christ over this issue. And so I want to talk today about the different views of baptism and where they come from. And maybe we'll all have a little bit better appreciation for each other. Now to do so, there's really two things I want to talk about. I'll call it the moment and the mode, or the when and the way, however you want to put it. When do we baptize somebody? Well, there's generally two thoughts. One is you baptize upon the profession of faith, what's called believer's baptism. And the other is you baptize infants, you baptize babies. And then as far as the way is concerned, or the mode of baptism, well, there's generally two thoughts there too. You either immerse them in the water as we do, you dunk them under the water, or you just pour or sprinkle the water on their foreheads, particularly for the babies. So which one is the most scriptural? And which one does history point to? So let's take a look at our scripture here and let's see if we can answer these questions. And let's start out with scripture and let's start out with this idea of believer's baptism. And I would argue we see that right here in the reading today, Acts chapter 8. Here, Philip has been sent by the Holy Spirit down the desert road to Gaza from Jerusalem and he meets this Ethiopian eunuch. This Ethiopian was a man who was a God-fearing man. He had been to Jerusalem to worship. He was reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and Philip comes alongside of him. The man says, I don't understand what I'm reading, and Philip explains it to him. And it says in verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Philip preached the gospel to this eunuch. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And then it says in verse 38, he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. So it seems pretty clear to me here that the gospel was preached to this man. He responded to that message and requested to be baptized. It sounds a lot like believer's baptism to me. Now you might notice in the reading or in your Bible, if you have an NIV or if you have an ESV, there's no verse 37. All right, It goes verse 36 to verse 38. Verse 37 is left out of the more modern translations. And that's because the more modern translations look to the oldest Greek manuscripts as their source. But this verse 37 isn't found until the 6th century. So some scholars believe that it wasn't original, so they leave it out. And in my NIV, it's just a footnote. Now your King James will have verse 37, and it reads something like this. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, there we've got an express profession of faith by this eunuch. He heard the gospel, he professes faith, and he is baptized. Sounds a lot like believer's baptism to me. Now, if you want to uh, take a further look at this verse 37 just for a moment, That verse, while it doesn't show up in the texts until the 6th century, is referred to all the way back to the 2nd and 3rd century by the church fathers. And so I believe, and many others believe, that that was an original verse and should be in there. And I think it makes a lot of sense in the context too, so I like that verse. Even though my NIV doesn't include it, I would read it. So we see, again, gospel preached, we see that the response is profession of faith, and then we see that he is baptized. But that's not the only place. We can stay in Acts chapter 8. Earlier in that chapter, Philip was in Samaria, and he preached as well. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it says, When they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. 
So here we go again. Acts chapter 8, verse 12 seems to clearly state believer's baptism. And I can flip back in Acts to Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost. And looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 41 It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, about 3,000 were added to the numbers that day. So again, Peter on the day of Pentecost gets up and preaches this great sermon. People respond in belief, and then they're immediately baptized. So I would say from Scripture, there's a very express and for sure instances of believers' baptism. But then if I asked my Presbyterian or my Catholic friends or my Methodist friends, they would come back and say, well, wait a minute, David. You've handpicked those passages. We've got some of our own that we want to point to. And they might start with that same chapter, Acts 2, with Peter's uh, sermon on Pentecost, but they would take me back to verse 38. Here in verse 38, it says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then verse 39 says, The promise is for you and your children. And they would say, See, David? It mentions the children here. It's not just adult believers being baptized, but it's children as well. Then they might take me to Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, we have a woman named Lydia who hears the gospel preached by the Apostle Paul. And then it says about her, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Then she and her members of her household were baptized. So she heard the message. She responded. But it says the members of her household were baptized. And they would say, see, David, her household includes her children possibly even her infant children. In the same passage, you would see the story of the jailer. Paul and Silas are in jail. They're praying and singing hymns that night. The Lord breaks free uh, their chains and the doors, and the jailer runs in thinking that they've escaped. Verse 29 of Acts 16, it says, The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then broke them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. And so again, my friends would say, see, here's an indication that everyone in the family was baptized, not just the jailer. And there are actually five instances similar to this in the New Testament. And that would be their argument. Now I might say, all right, that's fine and dandy, but it never expressly says infants or babies. It says members of the household. You're implying that there's babies. It's not expressed. And so then they'll say, well, what about Luke chapter 18? And if we go back to Luke 18, verse 15... It says, people were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And they would argue to me, see, it says people were bringing babies to Jesus. If the people were bringing babies to Jesus, why shouldn't we baptize babies? And that's a part of their argument. And while I hear that argument, and I understand that argument, I still don't think it's as strong as the believer's baptism argument. We see expressly believers being baptized in the New Testament. We may see implied babies baptized. And so consequently, I think Scripture more fully comes down on the side of believer's baptism. Now, my Presbyterian friends would point to one more thing, and this is Colossians chapter 2, in verses 9 through 12. It says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. 
And the Presbyterian argument is that passage makes baptism parallel to circumcision. And when were the Jews circumcised? When they were babies, eight days to be sure. So they would point to that and say, see, there is some indication here. But again, I would say I think that's a weak parallel. And so I'm still going to stand here and say I think Scripture most expressly states believers' baptism. But what about history? What does history tell us? Well, we can look back to the writings of the church fathers. Now, the church fathers were that next generations of believers that came after the apostles. When the apostles died, that first generation and second generation and third generation, they're generally referred to as the church fathers. And they wrote a lot about all the different subjects. And here, in the beginning of the third century, one of the fathers named Hippolytus writes, Baptize first the children... And if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. Well, that sounds a lot like parents bringing their little kids to be baptized. The church father Origen even more expressly states it. The church received from the apostles the tradition of giving baptism, even to infants, is what he writes. So the church fathers seem to advocate infant baptism. So there's historical accounts that show infants were baptized. Now, history does not carry the authority of Scripture. Never will say it does, nor does it get close. So I'm still coming down on the side of believers' baptism because that's what I believe Scripture most fully teaches. But it does make me sensitive to the realities of, of the potential for infant baptism, both within Scripture and within history. So I think we need to be open and aware to that idea. Well, if that's the moment or the when you get baptized, what about the mode or the way? How are we to baptize? Once again, let's go back to Scripture. And we'll start in our reading today. Again, verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now that sounds a lot to me like they pulled the chariot over to the side of the road, they went down into the river, and then he baptized that Ethiopian eunuch by immersion. And the word In Greek, baptizo, where we get baptism from, almost everyone is going to agree that really means immersion. It means to be submerged. So when we read this, it seems clear that they went down into the water and he baptized him by immersion. And we see this throughout the other baptisms. Think about John the Baptist himself. Where was John the Baptist baptizing? In the Jordan River. That's right. So here he is, probably waist deep, chest deep in the water, and he's baptizing the people. And the clear meaning of the Greek word baptizo is to immerse. So I think Scripture very strongly tells us that baptism is by immersion. But then again, my friends of other denominations would say, well, hold on a second, David. Baptizo doesn't have to mean immersion. It doesn't mean it every time. They might point to Luke chapter 11, verse 38. In this story, Jesus is invited to the Pharisees' home for dinner. Jesus doesn't wash his hands, the ceremonial washing of hands before the meal. And the Pharisee is surprised by this. Now what's interesting for this conversation is, is the word where it says Jesus didn't wash is baptizo. So we wouldn't think that Jesus would immerse himself before the meal. That doesn't make a lot of sense. They say that Jesus didn't wash his hands. So this term baptizo can mean a ceremonial washing. We could look at other instances as well. We'll go back to our story of the jailer in Acts 16. Remember, He came in the middle of the night. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And then the chains fell off, the jailer comes in, and then he takes them back to his home. 
it then says, he immediately, he and his family were baptized. Now, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if at midnight, they're going to run down to the river and baptize themselves by immersion. You could argue, because they just washed the wounds of Paul and Silas with water, that they took that same water and poured it over the heads of these new believers. You could make that argument. It doesn't say that expressly, but I think it's a decent argument. But even more so, there's other instances where baptism doesn't necessarily imply being immersed. And I'll take you to 1 Corinthians 10. Here, 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 1, it says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. This is recounting the Jews passing through the Red Sea. As you recall, the Egyptians were coming up on them. They were trapped against the Red Sea. God separated the Red Sea so that they could pass through on dry land. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. It's a very interesting term for Paul to use. They certainly didn't get immersed in the water. That was the whole point. The sea spread and they walked through the middle. It was the Egyptians who got immersed. So it could imply that the baptism doesn't require immersion. They would point to 1 Peter chapter 3 as well. Here Peter is using Noah as an example for a symbol of baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3 In verse 20, it says, In the days of Noah, while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism. So they say, see, Noah and his family, they didn't get immersed. That was the whole reason why they had a boat. So maybe there is something to this. And one more time, you could look at Joshua chapter 3. In Joshua chapter 3, the Israelites leave the wilderness and go into the promised land. How? By crossing the Jordan. But what happens when they cross the Jordan? The water miraculously stops. The priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant step into the river, and as they do, the water is held back like a wall, and the ground is dry, and everyone passes through, so no one gets wet. And so my friends in the other denominations would say, see, here are symbols of baptism that don't require immersion. And they're pretty good arguments, I might say. So how do we baptize? If the New Testament doesn't expressly state how it's done, there's no instruction manual in the New Testament. There's one instruction. There's just one instruction expressly stated about baptism in the New Testament. And you know where you find it? In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the only express instruction we have about baptism. That when we baptize someone, we baptize them into the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Other than that, everything else, we're just assuming that we're reading the Scripture correctly. So what about history? What about history? What can history tell us about it? Well, I hate to tell you all, but history might come down on both sides. In the first century, there was an instruction booklet called the Didache. The Didache was written, we think, in the first century. It means the teaching or the instructions. And when it comes to baptism, this is what it says. Now about baptism. This is how to baptize. Give public instruction on all these points and then baptize in living water. Now most uh, translators think this term living water means water that is moving like a river or a stream. So baptize in living water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you do not have living water, baptize in some other. If you have neither Then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So here we have an ancient writing, an instruction to the church on how to baptize. I would say it shows a clear preference for immersion, that that's the best way, the preferred way. It's the way they talk about first. 
But if you can't do it that way, then pouring the water is okay, at least according to the didache. When we looked at Scripture, again, it seems to imply immersion, but there's arguments made for other modes as well. So where does this leave us? Well, personally, I was baptized as a baby in the Roman Catholic Church. I don't remember it. I have a little certificate somewhere that says it happened. But when I truly came to faith in Christ at the age of 39, I made the decision to be rebaptized. And I wasn't burned at the stake and I wasn't drowned for it either. <laughs> Praise God for that. But I made the decision for two reasons. One, experientially, I wanted to experience baptism. I knew I was now finally saved. I had really come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to experience baptism. And then also for others, I wanted my new faith to be expressed to them. It was an outward expression of my inward change. And so I made the decision to be rebaptized, And I think that was the right decision. Here in the Baptist church, if someone came to join, I would suggest to them that they do the same. But reading the Scripture and understanding history, particularly the division that's come, I don't think I'd be very adamant about it. I would want everyone to be baptized. You should be baptized. And you must be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But beyond that, I'm going to have to extend some grace. I don't want to divide the church. I want the church to be united. And I want people to feel welcome. And I want people to feel a part of this community. And I want us to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the Presbyterian church down the street and the Lutheran church and the Roman Catholic church. Because I think it's the unity of the church that's really being missed out. And I want to read something, and this might surprise you, but this comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It says, Baptism constitutes the foundation of communion among all Christians, including those who are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church. That's you and me. For men who believe in Christ and have been properly baptized are put in some, though imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. So we're in some communion with the Catholic Church. It's just not perfect. But that's okay. It goes on to say, they therefore have the right to be called Christians. Well, I appreciate that too. And then it goes on and says, and with good reason are accepted as brothers by the children of the Catholic Church. That's a real strong statement, I think. That we, though we differ with the Roman Catholics on the ideas of baptism and many others, are accepted as brothers by the children of the Catholic Church. I normally think of the Roman Catholic Church as being pretty strict and stern. But here I see them extending grace. It closes by saying, Baptism therefore constitutes the sacramental bond of unity existing among all who through it are reborn. The sacramental bond of unity. I like that too. As I said from the beginning, the ordinances, the sacraments as some call it, were given by Christ to unite the church. It defines us as Christians. We get baptized because we're believers. Because we're Christians. Or maybe we bring our babies to get baptized because we want them to be raised up as Christians. The understanding that baptism is important, right, of passage in Christianity is common to us all. And it's also common to us all that we be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Traditions vary, but those two things hold. And the one unifying factor is this, our faith in Jesus Christ. So while we do often talk about the diversity and division within the churches, I want to focus on the unity. We believe in the importance of baptism. We believe in the triune formula, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we believe that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is where we need to make our stand. So I hope I didn't rattle your cages too much today. I do believe that believer's baptism is the best time to get baptized. 
And I do believe that immersion is the most biblical way. That's why I chose to be a Baptist. I was born and raised Roman Catholic. I got saved in a Pentecostal church. I went to a Presbyterian seminary where they taught infant baptism. And before this, I was in a Methodist church where they also baptized infants. We chose not to have Christopher and Emma and Lily baptized as infants because of our beliefs. Yet the Methodist church still allowed us to be members. Then when we came here, that's when I baptized the children, when they made the profession of faith. And so I want that to be clear. There's many different views. I believe in our tradition. I think it's the right. But I'm still going to have fellowship with my other believers. Because what unites us is Christ. We're saved by Him and Him alone and not by baptism.